I'm here at UBS Wolfsburg in Zurich, where I'm going to be talking about the impact of green technologies on the global economy and how innovation in just about every respect is going to transform uh, the, our response to global warming. Global warming, a huge threat, we can debate the science, but the fact is this, that the future will be dictated in the short term, not by the science itself, which is only a best guess about global warming estimates for the year 2050 and beyond, but it will be determined by emotion. The passions of ordinary people about the science of global warming, the worries that people have, it's these things which will drive the response of government, it'll drive taxation changes, regulation, and indeed corporate behavior, because consumers will be sensitive as well as investors to these things. So what kind of innovations can we expect? Well, I've described the $40 trillion carbon boom as a whole series of innovations, and they can range from things like the use of uh, low-energy streetlights. Did you know that 5% of all the energy used in the United States of America and across the European Union is simply lighting our streets? By substituting low-energy street lamps, we can save half of that, around 2.5% of all the energy in these countries that's used, and the payback period is only five years. Another example is heat pumps. If you use heat pumps to heat homes and you put them in when the homes are built, the cost is very low. How do they work? It's the same as a fridge motor, but operating in reverse. A fridge pumps heat out of the back of the fridge to cool the inside. If you run it backwards, you take heat from the outside and you bring it inside the fridge. You turn the fridge, in fact, into an oven. A heat pump uh, that uh, works in a domestic situation has a long pipe which is buried under the ground outside the home, and that pipe runs very cold. As it absorbs heat from the, from the ground itself, that heat is then sucked into the house and it's literally pumped inside. And if you want to, you can run it the other way around and use it for air conditioning. Heat pumps can save over half the energy bill compared to, say, oil heating, uh, or around uh, 35 to 40 percent of the energy bill if you're heating your home with gas. Uh, another example is uh, the use of better air conditioning units in large office blocks. There are a very few office blocks that are fully optimized for air conditioning. And air conditioning can be one of the largest costs in terms of heating or cooling buildings uh, in places like Australia, for example. Just by rebalancing the system, you can find that a new air conditioning system can pay for itself in about three years. And after that, can save around 30 to 40 percent of all energy costs. Here's another way to save energy. Stop pulling down buildings after only a short period of time. Most people don't realize that 30% of the entire energy use of a building is in simply putting it up and knocking it down. It's a scandalous waste, therefore, to put up buildings which the architect knows are designed only for around 30 years use. Yet the fact is that if you look at the skylines of most major cities in the world, you'll see them filled with high-rise blocks which are designed to be pulled down, as I say, after less than a generation. If we can keep office blocks, kit it out, re-kit them out, and use those buildings for an extra 20, 20 years or so, then we can find there's a huge energy saving. Of course, uh, that may mean up upgrading the insulation and so on. Uh, but it's much better to do that than to pull the whole thing down. One of the reasons is that 7% of all the CO2 used worldwide, uh, emitted, al al almost all of that gas emitted, uh, that 7% comes from the use of concrete. In fact, half of it is uh, carbon dioxide released in the cooking of the ingredients to make the concrete. The other half is carbon dioxide that is released at the moment when you start to mix the water to actually make the concrete in the process of building. 7% of global emissions is an awful lot, especially when you think that 40% of all concrete in the world that is used each day is in China, and most of it in the coastal big cities that are being expanded right now. So you know, these, these are monumental opportunities for change. There is a, a new kind of concrete. It's called ecrete, which uh, uses uh, a, um, it's a composite material. It uses ashes from power stations and other kinds of things, plastic waste and other bits and pieces built into the concrete. It, it only emits 
half the amount of carbon dioxide. It only uses up half the amount of carbon dioxide. Um, and uh, if that was used worldwide, you could see, well, you can't use it in every situation, but we could easily see a 2% saving in global carbon dioxide emissions. And the list goes on. I could talk about nanotechnology, for example. These nanotechnology atomic level coatings can reduce the energy lost in every moving part, in every machine, in every part of the world, by 25 to 30 percent. Just think of it. And we could think about um, the, the, the tips that you can put on the airplane wings. You'll notice that most airplanes these days have got elevated uh, uh, tips at the end. If they haven't got those tips in, they're wasting between 3 and 7 percent of all their aviation fuel. It's a simple innovation. It doesn't cost much to do, and it has a short payback period. Or we could talk about the redesign of the hulls of ships, especially uh, the shape of their propellers and their rudders, which itself, together with new engine technology, can save another 20 to 30 percent of shipping energy costs, and so on, and so on, and so on. The fact is that scientific knowledge is doubling uh, roughly every six months at the moment. And in 30 doublings, uh, you get uh, well, you go, you go from one unit to a million units, amazingly. When you think about it, you go 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, you work it out. And you get there in an astonishingly short space of time. What that means is that within a generation, we will probably know a million times, literally a million times more science about the world and its future possibilities than we do today. And when we see the amount of money that will be poured in to try and develop solutions to global warming, uh, you can, you, you, it becomes obvious that we're going to uh, witness a tremendous revolution in technology innovation. And how will it all be paid for? Well, one of the ways it will be paid for will be out of energy costs. You see, if energy prices remain at only around $35, $45 a barrel, which is where they were before the spike in 2007, 2008, then it's true that quite a lot of these things will take a long time to happen unless they're made to happen through regulations and taxes. But if, as is very likely, once the global economy starts to pick up, we see oil prices start to rise sharply again from $45 a barrel up to maybe $80 a barrel, well, anything above $70 is great from the point of view of alternative energy because it's at that point we start to see the balance shift. It's at that point that solar cells start to become more economically viable. It's at that point that heat pumps start to make sense. It's at that point that wind farms and very many other technologies start to come on stream without any regulation, without any government subsidies, just because of sheer economic sense and payback periods being what they are. So watch this space. We're in for a very interesting time. But there are, other two, there are two other big things. One, of course, is nuclear, and the other is carbon storage. Nuclear energy will see a renaissance. There are around 63 nuclear power stations in the United States of America in 2009, and yet only one new power station is being planned right now. Expect that to change. Uh, we will see a whole host of uh, nuclear energy uh, uh, units being created over the next 10 years, 15 years. Many nations will aspire to the French model, where 70% of all their power comes from nuclear. That means that 70% of all miles driven by electric cars in France are nuclear-powered miles. And you've only got to add a little bit of wind and, uh, and other technologies like solar or hydroelectric, and you've got then a totally non-carbon economy as regards power generation. Uh, could that be a model for other countries? Yes, it could. Would it require massive nuclear prolifer proliferation? No, so long as the countries that went much more fully nuclear are countries which already have existing nuclear power. And we can expect new innovation uh, for next generation nuclear power, which will be nuclear uh, fu uh, uh, fusion rather than fission, pushing small molecules together rather than breaking up big, uh, big sort of pushing small atoms together rather than baking, breaking up big atoms. And that's very important too, because there's less waste and less potential for terrorist activity and overflow into other uh, contaminations and things like that. So watch this space. Carbon trading, also very interesting. We will see a, a $50 billion market by 2012 um, in carbon trading, carbon products, uh, where one company makes savings uh, in one department, and they're able to sell those savings to another company. So it's all here, and watch on YouTube, as I'll do a whole series more videos on this. But from here for now, it's an interesting world, and we will find solutions for the future.